I am, as I mentioned, Renita Chaudhary. I am currently, um, I run my own company in Delhi, where I spend most of my time. But this past semester, I've been teaching a class here, two courses actually, um, here at JGU, um, focused on entrepreneurship, um, startups, um, identifying good opportunities, identifying good ideas, how to launch a startup, what is a startup, um, all of that. So as part of my uh, affiliation with Jindal so far, um, I, um, in conjunction with JSI and the Dean of the Business School, we've decided to create a space that is very specifically for startups at Jindal. Um, as many of you guys know, there has been a lot of new startup ideas that have been coming out of the university. Unfortunately, they've all been kind of a little bit dispersed. Some great ideas, some great entrepreneurs, and so what we've decided to do is provide a space, physical and theoretical space, for all of you to develop out your careers, develop out your ideas, and develop out um, your startups and companies. So as one, um, one aspect of that is an innovation lab, which you might have seen um, kind of on this floor up there in that corner, which is a space for entrepreneurs to go and work on their ideas. Um, a second aspect of Startup JGU is um, this semester. <laughs> is this semester that we've created? Um, fix this. Right. Because as someone that has started with a company themselves and has studied it a little bit, there's no experience like doing it. Actually, right. No matter how much um, you can be in classrooms and as someone that does teach the course as well, we can provide you frameworks, we can provide you ideas, exposure, those kind of things, but you will really understand how to run a business and how to run a startup by actually doing it yourself. So we've come up with this semester, it's called RISE, and in that we want all of you to be working on a startup idea. Um, it's not mandatory, <laughs> as you're asking. Um, it is an option that is available to all of you. Okay. All right, that qualifies for this program. Um, and so what we're going to do for today is basically this. This is how we're going to go through it. We're going to start large, and then we're going to narrow down by the end of this um, talk to what exactly the program is and the details. So first we'll start um, looking at what is entrepreneurship. We'll start at the basics. Um, what does entrepreneurship mean? What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Um, we'll look at why it's even a good thing. Um, I know personally myself, um, you know, it's very, it's very fashionable to be an entrepreneur these days, but why is it actually beneficial, right? Do we, and does any of us really, really know? Thankfully, there's some research out there that has um, provided some points of why is entrepreneurship good for society? Keep them in your back pocket in case anyone questions why you want to be an entrepreneur. We're going to go over definitions. What exactly are we talking about when we're talking about a startup? What's the difference between a startup and a small business? Um, what's an investor? What's an angel investor? What is equity valuation? Equity, what's valuations? What's revenue? So we get all on the same page as well. Um, and then we'll go into the details of the semester. Okay. Let me get through all of this, and then we'll do questions and answers. Um, but if there's anything that you need further clarification on, please raise your hand. Sound good? Yeah? Cool. Um, do you want to buy? So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as I mentioned, I'm currently running a company called Armadillo Digital um, here in Delhi. Our current clients are, um, one that you might know is TransferWise, which is a London-based um, financial tech company. You know TransferWise, right? great for transferring money. Um, I'm not saying that just because <laughs> they're my clients. Um, we work with TransferWise, we work with a couple of startups in New York as well, and um, our past clients here in India have been um, Flint Culture, which is uh, arts and culture PR agency, um, Imami Art as well, I say Organic has been a client, um, and we do content writing, branding, marketing, as well as incubating new ventures too. So if you want to hear any more about that, we can discuss it afterwards. Um, I actually did my undergraduate at NYU um, in New York. I did it um, particularly on international relations. And I 
went to then a professional career in finance, where I was doing sales and marketing um, for financial companies. I think I've always had a bit of an entrepreneurial um, lean, but you know, I did want to get the corporate experience. Um, I went and got my master's in development um, out of the UK, and then I came to India. So there's a lot of a few other things in there, but again, if we have time later on, I'll tell you more. Okay. Actually, before I show you that, what do you guys think is an entrepreneur? Thoughts? Why? 
why is it good to have entrepreneurs out there? want more 
interesting ways for our younger students to be educated and we just came out, right? We want faster ways to get food from different restaurants, tomato came out. So it's not someone in the government saying, you know, everyone in India needs a delivery app. I mean, that didn't happen, right? It was people looking locally, fixing local problems. Yeah, so this one on, uh, I mean, it ties in for a lot of law students that we have here too, the rise of entrepreneurship and a regulatory environment and a justice system, right? If you create the next big thing, you're going to want to make sure that no one else steals it. You know, maybe a buddy next to you wants to steal it. Make sure that there's not, that's not possible, right? So as a business owner, you're always going to be incentivized to create a justice system that works for you, right? No one can see, there's copyright laws, there's intellectual property laws, um, labor mobility is important. So it starts to breed these kind of outlier effects, right? And then hopefully government regulation that helps support additional um, entrepreneurship. Turn informal economies into formal ones. We're seeing a lot of that right now. Um, Self-sustaining economies is really what the first two, um, well, the first one, right? I mentioned this already. Um, local hiring, local investors tends to be the way it goes initially. Um, it's going to probably, if you start a startup, probably your family and friends are going to be the first ones who are going to invest in you. Your dad can be an investor, right? Um, why? Because there's trust, and then hopefully everyone gets a little bit more wealthy as your ideas sharpen and you get your business gets stronger, right? So it does start to create economy, and this is very important for developing quote-unquote countries, um, where support and aid is no longer coming from the outside or from other countries, but it's coming from, in, from the internal consumer base and internal entrepreneurs, right? Internal systems. Of course, for those that have, you know, traditional barriers of entry, society, in society, um, entrepreneurship is a way up, you know. Sometimes we don't always um, recognize it that way, but, you know, the small tailor in the neighborhood, the small cook at our home, these are entrepreneurs as well. And for many women and those who are traditionally left out, entrepreneurship is a way for additional mobility, right? If you have a good product, hopefully, you know, you get more sales and you move up. Um, yeah, entrepreneurs are the same person all over the world. Their dad, so the, all this data is in this book up here. Stephen Colton and Muskrat, if you're ever interested. A Million Reasons Entrepreneurship is Good for You. Um, and so what this is, what they talk about is that people that have businesses in war-torn areas, if they have similar incentives in regards to suppliers, um, labor, regulation, they'll, they will work together even if there are cultural conflicts. And then we have um, investors and entrepreneurs, wealth creation, right? Investors get wealthy, entrepreneurs get wealthy, or, <laughs> um, and increased entrepreneurship um, drives more innovation, or innovation drives more entrepreneurship, which leads to more education, which leads to more innovation, and it's a whole cycle, basically why we're here. So educational education plays a very, very large role in um, how entrepreneurship progresses. Again, this is why we have rise. Okay, what's a startup? Some people have been in my class aren't allowed to answer. Anyone have the answer? What's a startup for you? It can be when someone tries to exit your idea.
to make a collective dream for people to execute on. So think about it, something, it's an idea that one has in their head that they then get other people to join and sign on and see that vision as well. It was all the startups that we see, with all the companies that we see, I mean, it all started with literally nothing. It's just like an idea that someone had in their head and was like, we can do this better. And then getting other people involved. So uh, the role of the team and influence on um, selling a good vision is part of being a very, very good entrepreneur. But startups have some very strict definitions. So while all of you are right, there's a little bit more um, parameters to it, right? So startup, a company that is in the first stages of its operations, often initially bankrolled by their entrepreneurial founders, um, as they attempt to capitalize and develop a product or service which they believe there is a demand. So what we can see here is that there's an expectation that a startup is early, right? It's early in its ventures. It's early in what it's doing. Um, Facebook, for example, at one point was a startup. It would never be considered a startup anymore, right? So it is something that people grad that companies graduate from. Okay. Early in its operations, typically founded by, um, typically funded by their founders or family or friends, which tend to be um, initial investors, right? And again, it's seizing on the opportunity that that's there. The importance. Sorry, can you see? Can you guys see? Can you guys see? Yeah. Sorry. Um, very different from a small business, and I think there's a lot of times it's very easy to conflate the two. What's a small business and what's a startup, right? Someone can start, um, uh, what's a business? One can be, someone can start a coffee shop that uses more technology, right? And in many ways it'll, hit some of these um, points on a startup, but it might actually end up being a small business that uses technology in a smart way and how they go about their business, but ability to scale and have the same amount of inputs for a desired output is really what makes and breaks the two. So, um, for instance, if you're looking at clothing, right? Every single piece of clothing that you create, say we all own a clothing company. Every single piece of clothing that you create, to make one more, you need more resources, right? So I make one shirt, I need, I make one shirt, right? This amount of input, this amount of output, one t-shirt, right? To make two shirts, I need to double that <laughs> input, and then I double the output, right? Basic economics, right? So it's one-to-one. -one. As, as your inputs increase, your outputs increase. And that's what you tend to have with a small business, right? How a startup is different is that with the amount of inputs, your output reach is, tends to be higher, right? So when the, when the team that made Instagram made Instagram, they made one product that could go to millions, right? They didn't need to make more, like a second Instagram to reach their second customer. They just need to make one product and that <coughs> people. And that tends to be a difference between startups and small businesses. Small businesses are capped, right? And especially on this, and you have to look at the input aspect of it. Um, if they need more people and they need more inputs for more product, it's a small business. Okay? And it's not a scalable startup. Technology plays a large role. These definitions were a little bit more um, interchangeable before, again, everything that we can do on the cloud now, but now there's starting to be a very large gap between an app that can go global and a smart coffee machine. Okay. And then there's an entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur has all the characteristics of an entrepreneur, has a good idea, sees an opportunity, takes uh, proactive approaches, but they're within a system, right? They're within a company. So you can be an entrepreneur within a company small, big, whatever it might be. Now, what's the risks and rewards of being an entrepreneur? An employee who's tasked with developing an innovative idea or project in this company. Risks and rewards. Yeah. You don't have full control over all the ideas. You don't have full control, exactly. What else? Higher salaries and things with being an entrepreneur. 
are much more insulated. Right? What, what, were, what were we talking about in class? There was an Apple product. We were talking about that didn't work out. What was it? Uh, yeah. Uh, air bubble. I'm sorry? Air bubble. Air? The Apple bubble. Yeah. What was it? Uh, the Apple air bubble. That got canceled by Apple. Yeah, it got canceled by And you know, like, it got canceled by Apple, but the employees probably just moved to a different part of the company, right? It's not like they lost their livelihood and then they were broke and then they like didn't have anything to do anymore, right? Smart people, the company probably insulated the employees and just moved them to somewhere else, which is what is the reward of being part of being an entrepreneur. Um, and a lot of legacy companies are currently in this state, and I think there should be a lot more entrepreneurs than entrepreneurs here. Um, everywhere actually in the world because there's a lot of innovation that can happen within companies. Uh, you don't always need to go outside, but the companies need to be open to it. Of course, it protects you from downside risk, but then your upside risk is also a little bit limited. Can I just yeah. There are also another breed of this entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where large corporations, uh, once they create this bubble, right, for, for entrepreneurship or within their own mm -hmm. Then they split it off as a separate company by itself. <coughs> and so they may get certain equity uh, back into, into the corporation, but then the, the, the entrepreneur then becomes the entrepreneur uh, and then moves away. So the a lot of companies like City Group has done that, Wells Fargo has done that, you know, many of the large corporations, Xerox has done that. Many of these large corporations they do uh, encourage their employees to start. Exactly. I think I think more companies should create entrepreneurial uh, training <laughs> and entrepreneurial management systems because it benefits everybody, right? Those that want that are talented and have new ideas, have an ability to experiment, and the companies have to be willing to take that risk as well. Okay, maybe what if it doesn't work, right? Some more definitions in investor. Um, person, a person or entity um, who commits capital with the expectation of receiving financial returns, and this can be a, a wealth creation, right? They expect their valuation to go up of their share. Um, then you have angel investor, usually a high net worth individual who pro provides financial bank and backing for small startups or entrepreneurs. Um, angel investors typically um, tend to take on more risk because they're getting in earlier. Um, and it tends to typically be family and friends on the most part, but there are a lot of programs now where people do want to invest and they're willing to be angel investors um, for new startups. So it's really important to be clear on these, because I know we hear a lot in the news, oh, this company got an investment, that company got an investment. It's what it actually means, right? <coughs> equity ownership um, versus, say, loans, right? We have to be clear that, you know, it's, a company giving another company a loan, or are they actually owning part of it? And what comes with owning shares, right? Um, and what percentage does the company own, right? Um, do they have decision making on this? Say, has anyone been, follow anyone been following SoftBank and WeWork? Yes. Yeah? What's going on at SoftBank and WeWork? What's the latest news? Uh, so, uh, I don't think I'm going to offer
when you guys are all in RISE and we're looking at your documents, we'll go into this a little bit more, right? But investors, there are passive investors who are like, okay, take my money, I just want my wealth to increase, and then there's active investors who are like, I will kick you out if you don't do what I say. <laughs> and then equity, of course, is owning um, a stake in the company. Shares. Last row. Um, evaluation. So, of course, we're hearing lots, lots and lots of news on Bijou's valuation and all of this. Um, and I sometimes have to even correct people and say, valuation does not mean revenue. Let's be clear on that. Right? Um, there's a lot of companies that are valued at a very, very high number, but their revenues don't match that, right? Or aren't near that. Because valuation is dependent on future growth and future profits, and as well as intangible items um, such as brand value and um, uh, future clients or customers and projected worth. Right? So I read an article the other day that was like, oh, um, XYZ company headed by a woman is going is, you know, to be the first billion something something. You look at their revenue, their revenue is $12 million. Now, valuation is dependent on the analysts involved. Right? Again, it's not revenue, it's projected worth. So something can be projected to have a very, very high valuation that sometimes does not match the revenue, and that's why you see sometimes these things fall apart. WeWork is a fantastic example. $48 billion is what it was supposed to be worth, it's now at eight. This is eight. Revenue, income generated, and then profitability. The probability, what was interesting about the definition is that it's a relative definition. It's about the efficiency <laughs> of your company. So if something's profitable, yeah, you could be make, you're, you would be profitable if you have one, 100 rupees over your cost, right? All your costs are 100 rupees over, you're profitable, right? But profitability measures how, yeah, how profitable are you over your cost, right? Are you, if you're just 100 rupees profitable, okay, great job, you're profitable, but that's not going to work. Are you a thousand rupees over your cost? Then we can start talking about everything. Are you fifty thousand rupees? You know, so it's a profitability is a measure related to what the company's cost. Everyone clear? Any questions? Got it? Proper school. Okay. Now, I told you what the grand name, you know, the grand um, definition of a startup is, but Startup India is very, very, very clear. Has anyone heard of Startup India before? Okay. Has anyone heard of Startup India? Um, what is it? Incorporation registration has not exceeded 
125 crores. Making, if you're in year two, making 100 crores, you're not considered a startup. Um, it has to be innovative, it has to be scalable, um, it has to be an improvement on products, right? If you're doing something that's already existing, but you hit number points one through three, but it doesn't hit four, it doesn't count. And I think that's it. The government, of course, is focused on high potential employment generation.
common sense about you, there's a lot of good ideas I think you should take advantage of. The worst thing I've seen is when a really, really good idea can't be matched by the entrepreneur who thought of it. Um, one thing I will say about these numbers, the 108% growth in total funding, unfortunately, there has been within the last year a dip in um, seed stage funding. Seed stage is like that beginning stage, um, right? When you're going out and you're wanting initial investment. Maybe you have a prototype you've created and now you're going out for investment. Um, investment in seed stage startups had decreased last year. Hopefully we'll see a little bit more of an increase this year. But overall, the investment um, world is very, very interested in scalable startups. Um, 400 plus Indian startups expanded globally. Oyo, Ola, Zomato, Witty Beef, Beef right? They're going into new markets, um, some in South Asia, some in the Middle East, some in Africa, some everywhere. Paytm's going to the US as well. So the scope isn't just for Indian homegrown brands to service India, there's huge scope for our companies to go global. Yeah, this is the president of NASCOM talking about how they want to make India a startup hub, part of the Startup India initiative. There's, of course, you know, criticisms that people can say about it, absolutely. But I think with the amount of young people that we have, the amount of wealth generation, and the amount of risks people are willing to take, there's a huge potential for growth. And there is room for everyone, I believe, um, in the startup world. Okay. Any questions? All right, we're gonna power on through. Ready? Very good. So this is this is all laying the context for Rise. Okay. So it's the research and innovation semester for entrepreneurs next semester, spring 2020. So those who um, I know typically it's you know dissertation, it's an internship. This is a new option for you. It is a final semester. It's everything holding you between you now and graduation, um, and where you can work on your startup idea <coughs> with a team, or you can work with a team on another startup idea for those, I guess, four months, five months? Four months, yeah, five months. Four months. Um, and the goal of the program is to, number one, if you have an idea, to further your own idea. Number two, learn how to work on a team on a new idea, right? One of the things about a startup, especially when you're bootstrapping, is that you are playing the role of HR, of finance, of boss, of employee, of coffee delivery person, right? You're playing all those roles. So giving you guys experience of working on a team on where you have to have multiple hats. <coughs> on an idea that maybe isn't tangible yet, right? Maybe you haven't made a project, product yet, but you're working towards it. It's a great skill to develop. Um, just also, I mean, you guys are graduating, so having an experience of working on a startup can then get you, um, hopefully, a job at a startup as well, right? It's great for resume building, um, this whole experience. And it's just going to be fun, I think. I personally And you can also, you know, try um, further your idea. This will be as serious as you want to take it. So if you do, I know with Maharshi and Cloth Bearer, their thought was, I don't want to work for someone. I'm going to start my own business and work for myself. They started it during the university after classes and all of that, and now this is what they're going to do, right? And you guys can take it that way as well. But now it's part of a program. Um, spring semester, right, five months, there's going to be a five assessment milestone, right, and they're going to include individual assessments as well as peer evaluations. And then it's going to end with a final pitch. We would like all of you to be have investor ready pitches by the end of the semester, but it will be judged if your venture is viable. Right? We need to see, make sure the finances make sense, the idea makes sense, and we're going to help you throughout the semester to make sure that you do have something that's realistic, viable, measurable, um, you have a plan in place, and then those that do and qualify, we will put you in front of investors to invest in your company, but if not, 
It will be a final pitch with the startup JG routine. Right? We do not want you to be going, if you're at A1 and you say you've done the 
business model, Kansas already, we do not want you to be completing A3. Okay. This whole process needs to be laddered and step by step. We don't want, none of this is supposed to be done in silos and separately, right? So A1 is your idea, A2 is customer search, uh, survey and research, and that information will then lead to what is gonna be on your business model canvas. Those that have done the canvas know how they're all related, right? Your customer channels, your customer relationships, is all determined by the data that you collect in A2. Okay, two-part application process. So we're gonna have, so all of you will be in rhyme for those that chose to, choose to be in rhyme. Um, the application is going to ask if you already have an existing idea. Now, if you have an existing idea that you do want to follow through on, you can choose to be a RISE founder. If you're a RISE founder, you will then be given a team. We'll figure out the sentence um, of how we choose the team. But you can have a team working on your idea as a RISE founder. Or you can be a RISE participant and then be working on an idea by a RISE founder, um, working on a startup GGU venture, or a real venture that's out in the market, um, or a venture by a faculty member. Yeah. Does everyone just see the difference? Is it clear, right? So RISE participants get to work on a team on a different on an idea, while RISE founders get a team to work on their idea alongside them. So this allows for anyone that has already thought of an idea to continue with it. We don't want you guys, if you're already far on, you know what you want to do, we want to be able to give you the option to continue with it and be given more support. But those of you that just want experience in working on a startup and how that works, you're going to be a rise person. Um, the first application will talk will ask you about which one do you, do you want to be, um, and then your skills and competencies and your industry and sector for um, a rise founder. After that application, once we gather all the applications, we'll then be sending out a second part um, that is going to help match you guys with the startup idea that's appropriate. Yeah, so mentors and coaches, as I mentioned, they're going to be part of this program. You're going to have access to them. The coaches, you decide how and when you'd like to meet with them. Um, mentors, you have to meet with every month or every four weeks, right? Um, as a startup JPU, we will provide you access to the, le uh, the legal entrepreneurship cell, which helps companies get registered and take care of their legal documents and do founders agreements and all those kinds of things. Okay, I think that's it. We made it through. Okay. Which again indicates a right set of questions. Mm -hmm. So will we be also having some workshops in pre-rise yeah. when students enroll, just to make sure that they are brushed up with the concepts before getting into the market with their team to collect data. Right. That is, I know, I, to, to be frank with you, we hadn't thought of how we would frame that, but it's great to know actually from having experience in it what the students need. So we'll create that. I do think that's really, really important to make sure, yeah, exactly, that we have thorough and strong data and they are asking the right questions and all that. Yeah. Especially like, uh, what's the difference between a mentor and a coach? Sure. Uh, what's the difference between a mentor and a coach? Who wants the sports here? So what the, who watches cricket? Someone? Cricket? Soccer? Football? Come on. All right. What does a coach do?
play the game. How are you going to get sales? They're going to be looking at much more of the broader context that you're operating in. Well, a mentor is to guide you individually in your own self-development as an entrepreneur, as your team develops, and we'll be looking at that. Of course, there's going to be some overlap, but I think the mentor, how we formulate it right now, is the mentor is going to be much more um, involved. Okay, good. <laughs> 